move on. We got a special guest here tonight. Our dear sister's revisiting us tonight, man. Our sister, she helps up uh, speak to a lot of women's rights and women issues, women health. Uh, Jamie, can you bring in our dear sister, Kelly Davis? What up, Kelly? Hey, Kelly. Hi, everyone. Hey, Hi. Kelly, you're back. How are you feeling, baby? How you doing? I'm back in full effect. I've been listening in um, after that last segment. Y'all was laying me out. Woo. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about well, that. You're a little long. Yeah, Kelly, help. we're happy to have you back again. Thank you. We need you because there's a lot going on. There's yes. a lot going yeah, on, obviously. There's a lot going on. Go so ahead. what I've got to ask, obviously, first of all, when you heard this come down, this, this uh, historic uh, decision, what were your first thoughts? So um, I have to say, as a person that spent the better part of 20 years really devoted to sexual and reproductive health, the overturning of Roe v. Wade actually didn't come as a shock to me. Oh, thank if, you. If you're shocked, you maybe haven't been paying attention because right. states all across the United States have been chipping away at um, access to all kinds of health care, but particularly uh, when it relates to access to abortion. So um, when we were having the Supreme Court hearings, when Trump was uh, attempting to appoint three uh, Supreme Court justices, you could see them in their confirmation hearings not answering the questions related to abortion access. And we they did exactly what we thought they were going to do, right? Which is overturn, you know, one of several uh, human rights that they've been taking aim at. And so next up, and Clarence Thomas, as he said last week, next up is gay marriage, right? Next up is actually gay relationships or queer sex. Right, all kinds of things that were based on our right to privacy and the legal argument that the government doesn't have any right in our business when it comes to like what's happening in our bodies, what's happening <coughs> in our homes. All of those decisions are coming before the Supreme Court again, interracial marriage. And even I, I don't think that's gonna come up because Clarence Thomas, he ain't saying that shit. Well he got him a snow, he got an old snow bunny, old snow bunny. Well, uh, it's still based on the same legal precedent. And so we don't know how um, Amy feels about that. We don't know how Justice Scalia feels about that. And this might be the one thing that breaks, right? So we have three mostly liberal Supreme Court justices. And then we have a whole host of others that are really um, attacking all of our human rights bit by bit by bit by bit. So I'm not surprised. Yes, Kelly, very well said. Thank you, sister. She's so cute. She's like, yeah. <laughs> she said, I did say that pretty well, didn't I? <laughs> so, so, Kelly, what, well, everything that has happened, what does this mean for black women, black and brown women, to be honest? And, well, poor, and poor. I'm sorry, poor and poor whites, too. Let's keep it a buck with that, too. Mm, very true. So, you know, our lives are really on the line, right? Um, and th there's a variety of reasons. So the last time I was here, I educated you all on where we are with the Black maternal health crisis, right? The fact that Black women, Latino women, it's more dangerous for us to give birth today than it was when our parents gave birth to us, So for everybody on this call. And so um, that relates to abortion because before Roe v. Wade, the leading cause for maternal death was actually having unsafe abortions. And so all automatically, what does it mean for black women if we're already dying at very high rates, three to five times in New York City, eight to 12 times more likely to die than our white counterparts in a, in a state that is supposed to be a good state where we've expanded Medicaid, where you have more um, rights to fight discrimination. All of these things mean that when you take abortion away, even more Black women are going to die. Um, also, I've been saying this uh, as I make the kind of rounds across the nation for the past week, but the war on drugs to Black men is going to be what this abortion is to Black women. And so what folks don't understand is the long game. What can't felons do? Vote. Yeah, babies. Vote. <laughs> Oh. Right. And so what's going to happen when you have the strongest voting block, right, criminalized and it's a really it's another form of voter suppression. And so that's what folks are not seeming to get, that this is actually not just about babies and women's rights and Christianity. This is a coordinated 
attack at our like civil liberties in order to concentrate power and uh, in the hands of like wealthy white people. And so that's really what's kind of at stake for us. And that's actually what's at stake for you too, because a lot of these states are gonna start making it compulsory. If you cannot have access to reproductive health care, they're coming up, they're also gonna be thinking through what it means to access contraception. So if contraception becomes illegal, if abortion becomes illegal, and the vast majority of states, then in order to get state assistance, they're going to require that you state who is the father of your child. And if they are not paying child support on time, we're going to come back around. And what does that mean for black men? Incarceration. Right? So for-profit right. prisons are going right. to be filled. It's going to be another type of incarceration and so folks are not understanding the long game for our political power for our community building what it means if you have another large part of the population and more trumped up charges that you can bring against us because they can't police this equally you can make abortions illegal but you can't stop them from happening but who will they go after it's going to be what you said Damon. the people who are poor the people who are black, the people who are brown. And so all of these things, it's not just about reproductive health. I care a lot about reproductive health, but it actually is one way that they're using to keep power concentrated because nobody votes more and more consistently than black women and queer people. So if you can criminalize us, right? It's better for those of us that don't believe that we have a right to be humans and fully exist. Mm, mm, mm. Let me ask you something, Carly. Do you think some of this is done because, you know, man, I'm thinking about black mind. That since white people ain't fucking enough and having babies. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> I'm they're just coming, saying. They're coming to scroll. <laughs> they're not having yeah, sex. I think, right. think scroll is on the way. No, yeah, it's on no, way. They're not having sex as much. And then that, the white men and the got opioids killing white kids all, all day long. So they, and it looks like the grounding of America is going to be what twenty a few years from now, right? Thirty years, maybe forty years. You think this is really the? That's I'm just asking. Do you think that's the reason why they want the reason why they want this to happen? Why well, they made it happen? Well, if you've been watching kind of political pundits and just like racists and bigots, you'll you'll hear this idea of replacement theory, right? Mm -hmm. That there's not enough white people to replace the white people that are currently here. Um, and so we have to do these things in order to make sure that white women do not have access to the workforce, right? That they cannot control their destinies and that we can replace ourselves. But I'm here to tell you, one is that that's a load of BS because you can still keep power in a very, power isn't necessarily a numbers game. Think about South Africa. I was about to say that. Yeah. My sister's smart. Go ahead. Right? <laughs> a Black nation where all of the wealth, all the political power was kept in a small fraction Right. And so people are using that as an excuse to, again, power grab. But from the Civil War to today, the thing that gets uh, particularly the history of this country that gets poor white people to vote against their own self-interest is this idea that actually it's not capitalism. It's not the poor wages that's keeping you down. It's this black person over here. It's this Mexican. Right. It's this immigrant. Right. And so folks buy into that and then vote to keep wealthy white people that they have nothing in common with in power right. because they believe that that is also what's owed to them by virtue of their skin. And so that's the function of racism um, to allow, again, political power. So this is it's not necessarily a numbers game, but they're using that as an excuse to really drum up a lot of racist violence. And we're paying the price. Like the, the Black women uh, that were shopping the elderly women that were shopping in Buffalo, New York, paid the price with the same thing that states are using that are going to go after your uh, Black women and trans folks who are having abortions, right? It's the same sick mindset. And it's only you're substituting the violence of one sick individual for the violence of an entire system, right? And it's still, the results are still the same. We're going to wind up being dead. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Kelly, you mentioned the uh, domino effect of, let's say, uh, of, of this, you know, um, you know, it, how one how one decision triggers, uh, you know, all of these other ancillary, you know, effects 
throughout society, just kind of uh, ripples throughout society. How do you get people to buy in? Because currently, you know, you have the conservative black folk, whatever that is at this point, you know what I mean? Um, saying, oh, well, you know, siding with, oh, well, this is, you know, I've seen this, you know what I mean? Well, good, you know what I mean? Like, finally, you know, women are going to have to do X, Y, Z, and, you know, we have to be responsible and all of that, you know what I mean? I mean, it's obviously, first of all, abortion is, the decision to have an abortion has to be the most, one of the most traumatic things that a woman can feel, you know what I mean? It has to, be, you know, so... The idea that people are just doing this willy nilly and everything. I don't know how people, are really, I mean, it's, it's to the left, but how do we get people to buy into this? How do we get people to connect to it though? What do you think? Well, I, I too come from a um, evangelical Christian background. Like I'm the descendant of enslaved Africans. Like I grew up in the South. And so um, these are some of the things I've been saying and educating my own extended family and community members around. And I say like, if you are if you are parroting and saying the same things as people that you even think are white supremacists, then maybe you should do some self-reflection, right? I also talk about the fact that so many of us know somebody in our life that had a later miscarriage, right? Had an ectopic pregnancy. And I was I, I list out my aunts. I list out my own mother who had a, uh, my brother, she had a, she was almost six months pregnant and my brother died inside her womb. If she didn't have abortion health care, she would have died. Do we think that this is the kind of society we want to keep? We know that black women, because of stressors, all of the things caused by racism, environmental degradation, poor quality health care, have these poor pregnancy outcomes. Are we sentencing them to death as a result? Right. Is that the kind of nation we want? And when, I, when people say, oh, oh, also everybody here on this call knows someone who's had an abortion. Someone here on this podcast, men do not talk about men have abortion stories. Women hey, 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 are not the hey, only hey. people with abortion stories. <laughs> who, my, about, who told you about my wife? Allegedly, allegedly, <laughs> allegedly, <laughs> allegedly, allegedly. <laughs> you know, and it's just something horrible when the folks that are 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 anti-abortion and quote unquote pro-life are, you know, so many men are in that area. But when it comes to protecting, you know, sexual and reproductive health, sometimes our black and Latino men are not anywhere to be found. And so I would say to those of you watching today, if you have an abortion story, share it with someone that is close to you. So many of the men in my life could not have the lives that they enjoy today had it not been for abortion. Let me let me ask you this question, Kelly. Um, how has this changed what you do? How, how do you now, uh, do you have to count, come up with some type of new pragmatic approach when dealing with young ladies as far as messaging, as far as, you know, reproduction and education? How do you now, how does this change what you do? Well, in some ways, it hasn't changed what I do that much. It definitely has um, educated some folks and given me an entree to talk about what is and is not available at different states across our country. It definitely, however, has lit, um, it's lit a fire under me to really talk about civic engagement and what and voting as like a tool of harm reduction. So we all know that the laws, the the, the Supreme Court, not, none of these bodies, legislative bodies have ever really affirmed black lives, right? Never, point blank period. So what the Supreme, you know, the Supreme Court really has shit to do with my life. However, you know, this is just the entree to getting folks um, really activated around political activism, understanding like how laws are passed and understanding, say, hey, uh, we often turn out for federal elections, but not for state elections, right? But a lot of what happens is determined by the, your state, right? So it's a, your governor, right? It's your lieutenant governor. It's um, your attorney general. It's your DA. So even laws can be on the books, but if we don't mobilize to have our DA candidates that say, if a law is on the books, we're not gonna criminalize that. And we've seen what black advocacy can do. So many DAs across this country have now said, yeah, you know, cannabis is illegal, but our my office is not gonna spend time persecuting any, you know, folks anymore. 
for like weed, a personal personal possession. We could do the same thing with abortion. And so really what I'm saying to everyone is vote in your midterm elections, but not only just vote, but also organize. Like we have to be in the streets. We have to be telling folks what we will and will not accept. And we also have to change the narrative around whose issue this is. Every time you even see the word abortion on the news, it's like a white woman with a pink pussy hat on and a little <laughs> sad ass sign. That person, we're in the situation today because they didn't talk to their grandma, they didn't talk to their mother, they didn't talk to their aunties, right? When 52% of white women were voting for Trump, that's why we're in today. So it's not the job of black women to fix what white women um, have historically messed up, but it is our job to protect each other. And so really this past week, um, me and uh, my other sisters and comrades in the reproductive health rights and justice space have been focused on getting like emergency need to folks had their folks who had appointments had them all canceled on Friday. And it's clear who is most at risk. You're more than likely to be killed while you are pregnant or postpartum than at any time in your life. Mm. Right. Yeah. For a woman. And so some folks are really seeking this kind of health care to, one, uh, you know, deal with crushing poverty that we know we don't get equal pay for equal work, deal with toxic situations, right, and just live the lives that they want to live. You know, also, we talked about the poor pregnancy outcomes. And so I think for a for some of folks, what happened last week with the Supreme Court was definitely an eye-opening situation for how to get involved in the political process, which includes legislation. But let's not forget things around civil rights traditionally, which Black women have been the backbone of most successful social movements in this country for the last 100 years. Right, whether it's LGBTQ rights, whether it's civil rights, we have definitely been the backbone to all of these movements. And also this movement, we are the backbone to this movement, but we have to organize. Laws only change when we organize. It's not the other way around. You don't get freedom because the law change. You push for your freedom and that's what gets the law to change. And so I think people are really waking up to that today. And I'm hopeful that black men are doing the same because you guys have something in this fight. It's gonna, anything, that has to do with incarceration, right? Making something illegal is going to hurt black people the most. Okay. It's coming for y'all. So every time I hear so a black man uh, be hotep with me and say, oh, we don't need, you need to be having babies for the revolution. I say, brother, I hope you pay your child support. Yeah. That's fine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because they're, if not, they're coming for you. Oh, you live in Kansas. You live in Oklahoma. You live in Pennsylvania. Even you live in Ohio. They are coming for you, bro. Even in New York, the the state we t we can tend to hold up states like New York and California. There are gubernatorial candidates that say that they're anti-abortion and they're going to appoint health commissioners that are anti-abortion. What does that mean for people who don't pay their child support in Brooklyn? Yeah. You tell yeah. me. Yo, 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 what's up, what's up, what's up? If you like what you've seen from the Four Brothers here, give us a thumbs up. Like and subscribe to the channel so you can stay notified when we go live and post new content. Thank you for the support. Well, the, 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 the expression you used when you said it lit a, a fire under you, most movements that have started, especially in this country with young people, is because of that. It has to get something that that makes you angry or makes you uncomfortable that gets you out to organize and gets you to the polls. So I expect uh, there to be fireworks this midterm, you know, when these elections come around. People, I think you're going to see that because this anger and stuff, because I tell people all the time, marching and stuff looks good on camera. Realistically, you know, you got to make some changes. Um, you got to be really proactive, you know, economically and also as far as your vote and getting into this process. So I absolutely agree with you. I mean, we all have a role to play. So, Kelly, let me ask you a question. So, like, we know rich white people are going to have access. They're going to be able to fly, take their flight to, to Europe if they want to have that abortion, fly up here to New York City and, and places like that. What, what, and when you in those circles and those rooms talking to those people in those those red states where they can't, what are the, what are the poor people saying? Because they, because they take, go to say they want to go to Mexico, right? Or New Mexico or someplace to travel there, like to get a, get a bus ticket. To get a hotel stay because you're gonna probably stay for a day or two. You might have to have somebody with you to escort you because they don't want you leaving to go dizzy back to your hotel room or whatever like that. What are they? What are those people saying? How like I want to like what are they echoing? I just want to know what they like. 
Well, I want to be clear that people tend to think of abortion was legal, but illegal, illegal does not mean accessible. Legal does not mean affordable. I grew up in the state of Mississippi, which had one abortion clinic, right? So abortion, even in, in New York State, even in states like Pennsylvania, it, it has never been totally accessible for like black people. Medicaid doesn't pay for abortion. It's been barred. Like there are so many challenges that we have in accessing proper reproductive health care. The last time I was here, I talked about maternity care. We don't even have high quality. So we've, ne we've never really had it. And so in some ways, um, if you are hysterical after the Supreme Court, that's a function of your own privilege, right? The wealthy white women in my life were hysterical at the idea that they could live lives that were restricted in any way to the way that our lives are restricted to every day. However, I think that the people that have been organizing in the South for decades are now harnessing this national energy to say like, we need support. We have to get people out of wherever they are. And keep in mind that what happens, like you said, Damon, if we have folks from, let's say Ohio, where abortion is now illegal after six weeks, and most people don't even know they're pregnant within the first six weeks, right? So if people are traveling now to New York City to get that abortion, what does that mean for this person who is working at an hourly worker at the T-Mobile store, who has two children, who can't like, they also don't, so even though they live in a place where it's legal, is it accessible? And don't forget that this is all happening while we're still in an ongoing pandemic. Yeah, and I seen them selling, I said it, uh, I was going to do this, but I said it was going to be foul. They're selling Plan B online for a thousand dollars. I was gonna sell it for five hundred, cut them, but they sell it for they sell it for a thousand. I'm not saying well, I mean, I'm opportunist. Emergency contraception, <laughs> right? Which is Plan B, which is not the abortion pills. Um, those are being called Plan C, but there are all these kinds of things. Uh, contraception is gonna be also up next. Folks are also. Mm -hmm. um, outlawing contraception. So really when you think about why, what does it mean? How does it support wealthy white men to have everybody outside of the labor market, right? To have folks chained to low wage work, right? To have folks too tired, right? to be able to participate actively in society, to organize for their own power. It all keeps their wealth, their riches, their power concentrated in them. And so this is what that's really about. So do not become an illegal pharmacist. Then you're really gonna get locked up, bro. And we need hey, you. Hey, 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 hey. I got a, I got a different name. <laughs> oh, Jamie, Jamie. Oh yeah, my producer Jamie said he wanted to bring us some of the comments. So Jamie, bring us some of the comments. I was gonna ask a question from Jamie, but let's go to the comments. Sally says, what I'm not understanding is that they don't want people to get abortions, but then also don't want to support people with taking care of the kids. That's right. true. That's why pro-life, I never used the term pro-life because the people are not pro-life because well, how can you be pro-life and you're pro-death penalty? Correct. Um, how can you be pro-life and you don't extend Medicaid, right? Even to kids. Correct. How can you be pro-life and you allow, you're not even giving folks access to like the basic thing, like you're not giving- Lunch programs, they don't even give better lunch programs. Wage. How can yeah. be pro-life when there is no uh, universal child care? Correct. Right? So they're not pro-life at all because they're anti everything that it would take to have, bring the child into the life. How can you be pro-life? You're not even supporting maternity care when a person's pregnant. Correct. 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 See, that was, that was going to be my question, but Kelly, you're doing such a good job on touching all these points. It makes it hard to give you a question. Yeah. The rest says, Kelly, preaching tonight, y'all. Pass yeah. the collection plate. Hashtag pass the collection plate. Damn, any more, any more, any more comp? Oh, here we go. Margaret, hey, uh, Mommy Priest. Hey, Mommy Priest. <laughs> what are some of the advocacy groups to link with? She wants so to there are a lot of um, organizations that are working all over um, the country, really, and these are some of the ones that are anchored by like black and Latina, so Latina folks, right, which we know are kind of the backbone to this movement. So I'm the executive director for New Voices for Reproductive Justice, which organizes across the nation, but also particularly in Ohio and Pennsylvania, which are two states of political significance, right? We call every black woman voter, we knock on the doors, we do what we need to do to educate them, to get them to the polls and to get them the resources that they need. 
if you're looking for another national org in our own voice, um, if you're in places like Texas, the FIA Center, uh, we also have like Women with a Vision in Louisiana. We have Sister Song in Georgia. We're part of a whole collection. The Reproductive Justice Movement is a part of a whole collection of um, Black led organizations that are really working to get dollars, resources, everything that Black families need, um, whatever services they need in organizing and disrupting to make sure that folks know that they have the right to have children if they want to, they have the right not to have children if they want to, and they have the right to parent the children they choose to have in safe and supportive environments. Mm. Kelly, mm. quick question. Why is it important to use ungendered language when speaking about abortion access? And why does new voices say birth individuals or pregnant individuals? So, you know, what's, what's key to understand is that everybody who gets pregnant doesn't think of themselves as a woman, right? That's not their gender. So folks that are transgender can become pregnant. Folks that are non-binary that can, can become pregnant. And the reason I like to stop using the word women often is that abortion is not a women's issue, right? Women are the majority of people who have abortions, of course, but abortion benefits everyone. As I said earlier, there are so many black men in my life, so many Latino men in my life that have benefited, you know, like from abortions. And, and I was talking with my friend uh, who was like, oh, I'm, I'm anti-abortion. I was like, where, if you had to, if you were paying for three children right now, do you think that you would be driving this Tesla? And he was like, no, he would not be driving that Tesla. He would be driving what I'm driving, which is a Honda Accord that is 12 years old. So we have to really like black, like the reason why I take gender out of it, so to speak, is that this, the emphasis on gender, um, it, it takes men out of the conversation. And I think that men have a key role in abortion advocacy and all sexual and reproductive health advocacy. And also every gender of person can have an abortion. Hmm. What got me, oh. when, you, when you put it to it with a goat scared for young for brothers and like thinking about that child support, that's what got me. That child support going to jail, shit. So you're voting <laughs> against your own interest. That's why I'm saying like, and so many of us do that. We're, we so, sometimes are saying things that were given to us that it's not even critical thinking skills. The abortion only became a Republican talking point in the 70s. That should be of note because that's when they really had to start desegregating schools and society. And that's when women start having to coming to work. And so they use a, this social issue, right, to get more power and control. And so for me, it's like the proof is in the pudding. Abortions have been happening for thousands of years. So why was it in 1970 that this became a huge hot topic issue for white men to start yelling about? Oh, because they had to begin sharing their power with black people and white women. Wow. Cool. Mm -hmm. You're killing it tonight, man. Yeah, you're killing it. You're on fire, Kelly. Took all my damn questions almost right from the top. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm, <laughs> Kelly, I'm going to pay you an ultimate compliment. You touched every point so well, it's almost impossible to ask you a question. I was like, yo, I don't even know where to go with it. On yeah, one, yeah. You know, but you keep on talking. You keep going, though. Word well, up. I mean, I just, those are, I, I, I say what I know. You know, and so I'm always thankful here because men don't often give women the space to come and talk about sexual and reproductive health issues, right? Think about our grandparents, think about our parents. It was, we didn't say these things. You maybe said them, you know, men talk about sex when I go to the barbershop. Woo, y'all talk, it's not that y'all don't talk about sex, it's not that y'all don't talk about abortions, but we're not having these conversations together, right? Mm -hmm. We're not, you know, uh, you know, women in my life lie about you know, our sexual and reproductive past because it's stigmatized, right? You know someone, you all, so, you know, you get four men of color together, somebody has paid for an abortion, someone's life has been, like, those are just the facts. Allegedly. Allegedly. <laughs> Right, you know, right. We've all have been touched. You all love someone who's had abortion. Someone's here. Someone's mother here on this podcast episode had an abortion. Someone's sisters had an abortion. Someone's wife or ex-wife has had an abortion. So uh, these things are men's issues. Men just don't talk about it. And so yeah. I'm here to say, like, if 
if you've been moved in any way, if you're listening today um, here at Let's Chop It Up, you know, be open to sharing your abortion story or being open to hearing someone else's, being a safe space for someone to share the fact that they have had an abortion, thought about having an abortion, have had an abortion with you. Because oftentimes um, there are certain there are certain cultural norms that we have that don't allow us to be as free as we possibly can. It's like, you know, is you know, men men in my life, men who I've dated, they expect you to have all these uh tips and tricks. Where do you think I got them from? You think you think all these women that, that folks are messing with, your sexual partners have all these skills and nobody got pregnant? Come on now. Yeah. It doesn't make any sense. Yeah. I um I was having a conversation with my wife Kelly and um she brought up a good point. She said that uh one of the topics that we never talk about in abortion is when a woman wants to have an abortion but the man doesn't want to have the abortion and he's willing to take the child but has no say in that because you know it's her body. And I found that very interesting. I said she's absolutely right. We don't have that conversation about men that want women to have the child and that they'd be willing to take care of take care of the child. But uh, I, I found that as an interesting topic that we don't never touch on, you know. You know, in, in a healthy, in, you know, <clears throat> because because pregnancy is, is mostly, um, you know, the pregnant person, which mostly for this conversation, I know uh, for many of you have wives and girlfriends and fiancés, um, you think about your your wife because we're often the the person bearing the physical consequence of the pregnancy. We have um, the the ability because it's within our own like body and control. Mm -hmm. You know, ideally, if you're in a relationship, of course, you should talk about sexual and reproductive health. Uh, issues but if you know not you're the person is not in my body the person doesn't have to deal with my like if i have diabetes or hypertension the you know someone else cannot choose for me to put my body at risk correct even if they want to to raise the body and so you correct. know that it really has to be the power has to lie with the person who is most affected but does that mean that partners do not have a role in abortion conversations absolutely not right they right. support abortions but i do think that you know we have to start talking about all the scenarios within our relationships within our society um i have to tell you in my social circle it tends to be the other way around there have been women often who have been coerced into having abortions by people who become abusive or are are you know do not want to have a child with a person, particularly if the you know folks are not in in a healthy situation together. So there are a myriad of different ways that um, to have sex, to make a to conceive a child, um, to be pregnant, and so I think that talking about each one and the ones that are uh, particular to you, your relationship, your body, your partner. Right. We have to be unafraid of having those conversations, because even if we think, you know, oh, I'm approaching 45, I don't have to have that. No, as long as you have a period, you can still get pregnant. Yeah. Right. And so we tend to think, oh, I'm 42, I'm 43, I'm 45. I don't got to worry about it. No, you still have to worry about it. You could be 47. Your wife could be 42. Your wife could be 43. You still have to think about that. Because what does it mean if all of your children, you know, I have friends in my life that got pregnant unexpectedly in their 40s and had mm. grown children. And like, I'm, I can't, I'm not doing this again. And it's not, I'm not in a healthy relationship. I'm married, but I just got my career back, right? I'm not, my children are now in high school. I am not starting this over again. And so chose to uh, terminate a pregnancy. So there are so many different reasons why a person would make an individual decision and each one of them are valid from the male point of view, from the female point of view, from the non-binary point of view, whoever you are, um, you have a stake in like what your reproductive and sex love life looks like. Uh, Tammy, can you bring up a couple of comments real quick? I was going to bring this up. Margaret Peace, Kelly, you are a highly educated, executive, open-minded, full of passion, professional, uh, laying down the facts to make us all educated consumers. All right, Fact. nice compliment. Uh, Norette says, women are shamed for having three baby daddies and shamed for an abortion. Women are always vilified no matter what they do. Yeah, and uh, 
Okay, Jalomelo Williams, abortion has been slow suicide for the black community. What, I'm gonna know okay. what he means by that. Cause I know a lot of woke pages, people saying that they don't believe in abortion or the black woke pages, but Kelly, can you wanna address that? Well, I mean, uh, sometimes just like the, the white conservative politicians, we found out that they've had abortions, paid for abortions, right? Um, they When their mistresses expose them, the same thing happens in our community. The folks that are, oh, abortion is murder, abortion is genocide, uh, have often paid for abortions, have often coerced folks to have an abortion or advocated for folks, folks in their life to have an abortion. Um, to me, slow suicide in, in, of the Black community would mean like Black women and queer folks not having agency and power, right? Not having critical thinking skills. To me, what it means to be Black is to be free. And freedom for me means I get to determine how I wear my hair. You don't tell me I have to wear my hair a certain kind of way. I get to determine what's on my body. I get to determine my own life, right? I don't know that I would be here before you today without birth control. Right, like I don't know, and there's so many of my other professional women that um, are black women are most educated subset of America. Right, we open more businesses than anybody, and so a, a lot of that is tied to us being able to control our own destinies, right, through our own health and well-being. And so, like um, some a commenter said, we're vilified, damned if you do, damned if you don't right? There's no perfect way to be a Black woman. There's no per perfect way to be pregnant. So you have to just choose what's best for you. But statements like so-and-so is detrimental to the Black community, I often have to say, who said that? And when I say why, 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 always at the end of that is a white supremacist thought where folks believe that Black people are either more criminal, lazy, that like all of those things were not thoughts that were created by us. And so we have to be like super critical. Anytime I hear the Black community is, should do this, or Black people don't do this, or Black women need to do that, I always know that that person, nine times out of 10, likely has a colonized mind. Mm. I know y'all looking at me. Um, <laughs> let me say, <laughs> I know. look, I got, you got to work with me with that too, because you know, they stole my Red Bull machine, but it might have been the white man. Look, no, I'm just joking. I'm joking. Let me say this. This is the thing. <laughs> so, so when I was a kid, I remember um, when when a young lady would get pregnant. It, it, it seemed like it was one of those things they send the, the person down south. Uh, one of one of the girls that were a little older than us, I never forgot. She got pregnant when she was 16 years old. Um, hid the pregnancy from my mother as long as she could. The baby wound up being born with water on the brain. And I believe that baby spent its life in the, um, I believe it, they used to call it the Ronald McDonald House or something like that. So it was something that was really shocking. I think today it's very, very important, especially young ladies, to understand um, there's information out here today. Um, it's not taboo like it was today that they can understand that that also if you're going to keep a child or whatever, there needs to be prenatal care. There needs to be just certain things that that they have to do because it's just dangerous on so many different fronts. And I think until speaking to you, I didn't even know a lot of the the, the statistics about black women um, dealing with people think we have a higher threshold for pain. Mm -hmm. uh, when you when we first uh, interviewed you, you mentioned that and how so many people uh, lose their lives during uh, trying to deliver. So um, it, it's, it's very frightening. We're living in some frightening times. We are definitely in the deep end of the pool, but I, I can't thank you enough for your life's work, um, for the passion that you have in, in doing everything you can to just educate people. I'm sure even this interview right now, you are saving lives by, by educating people and giving people the facts and the knowledge and, and definitely just know um, that it is greatly appreciated here. And I, I can't thank you more. Well, I'm always happy to be here. I It's been a long past few days. It's been a long, actually past few years of trying to advocate for Black women's health and well-being and Black sexual and reproductive health. Um, but I said, I'm going to stay up late and I'm going to be here for Let's Chop It Up because there are not many spaces I'm in that's a, a all men of color space that I feel respected, affirmed, and heard. So you guys, I'm going to turn it back on you, are creating safe spaces to have these conversations. Um, and it's the example that you are setting that says, Black men 
um, Latino men, it's okay to talk about mental health. It's okay to talk about sexual and reproductive health. Like we're humans, we all have sex, like shit happens. And so we have to be clear um, and that you guys have a key role in having spaces that many men don't have. Men are not going, many men are not, don't have access to go to the doctor, right? And, and they don't have, you know, what we have when we, we can flip through Oprah Magazine or Cosmo and, and, and learn about sexual health and well being right? You guys don't have those spaces. And so you guys are saving lives. Each time that you come here, you know, 10 years ago, if you had a group of four men of color, the situation about R. Kelly taking up for like black girls and women saying like, it's not okay, the sexual violence that we are experiencing. And that's also something else like black women and girls are subject to rape, sexual assault, and harassment at untold rates. And so what does it mean that it's saying that you can be a child and be raped by your abuser and have to carry a baby to term? Think about that. Yeah. Uh, we got we got a couple of more comments here. Uh, let me bring up, I don't know how you want to feel about action, but I'll, I'll chime in with you on this one, Kelly. So, Jamie, can you bring up a, what's her name? CeeLo somebody? Derek, Derek, you're on mute. Is Derek on mute? Sorry about, sorry about that. <laughs> uh, he says, uh, you want to stop complaining. White women wanted this, and they roped you into this. Uh, Margaret Sanger, the founder of, Pl of Planned Parenthood, was a, was a eugenicist of uh, black folks in favor of eugenics. And abortion has cut our population down by a third if we hadn't participated in the eugenic apartheid of Roe v. Wade. Well, I don't know about participating. Roe v. Yeah. Wade actually had nothing to do with us. It wasn't a black person that was bringing, you know, Jane Roe was not a black woman. Um, so I'm not sure exactly what that person mean by that. But I, to that person, I would say um, the following. One, did you read through Margaret Singer's all of her personal papers like I did? Mm, get them, girl. Maybe. And to that, I would say, you know what? She was a racist. However, you want to know what I also read in her personal papers? The hundreds, the thousands of Black women in Harlem who begged to have contraception access brought to Harlem because they were living in dire poverty, because they were tired of dying in childbirth, because they were working jobs and their husbands were getting killed in the war. Like all of those things, right? Like the Great Depression, World War II, like all of those things, people were clamoring for access to what white women had. Right, which was access to abortion, access to, through their private physicians, and all kinds of issues. And so, I would say I don't make any I don't make any excuses for uh, Margaret Sanger's racism. And I don't work for Planned Parenthood. I will call racism out every time I see it. However, does that mean that we strip Black people of the right to actually? Uh, have the health care that they choose? No, the government should stay out of my vagina. How about that? That's all I'm saying. The decisions I make about my life should be made by me and me alone, not by my legislature, not by these dusty men in robes, right? Not by Clarence Thomas. It should be made by me. And that is a liberatory thought. The right for Black people to control their own destinies right is a liberatory thought and if unless you have that same energy for child rape unless you have that same energy for black maternal mortality unless you have that same energy then don't bring it over here because i am not interested in selective single issue organizing audrey lord said it best people don't leave single issue lives so yes i don't i don't mess with a lot of white women who are racist in the repro space but does that mean i don't all black women should go without absolutely not absolutely not and so people who are un people who are unable to have nuanced thoughts right those are often like incel comments so i'm not i'm not really and it's always people who don't have their face in their avatar and i always wonder why that is <laughs> 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 
a white man masquerading as a black man talking about X, Y, and Z. So I'll say, I'll say that. My, you see my face? I, I put my face on what I believe, right? Let's see you do the same. Yep. I'm looking for a mic just to drop. Yeah. Around here, I got extra mic. I got extra mic. Just drop it. <laughs> let, me, let me tell you something. We never thought about this before, right? Until we had Kelly on the show, and it, I just just came to my mind. We're going to create a let's chop it up Hall of Fame with guests, and Kelly's going to be our first inductee. Yes, 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 yes. That's it. I can't so, Kelly, you got to go And also, and I, I want to go back to that I, comment before. I just want to say. Also with uh what's the name? Cello, Cello, Mellow Williams, whatever it is. The thing is with that brother, if you're not ready to take care of these kids and be that village leader and take care of these babies and not want it, don't don't say nothing. Let's sit quiet. Yeah. Because the real cause like you, like all these babies running around, these babies running around, are you able to feed these babies? Because it, how many people, how many trauma people had to send babies down south? Are you gonna be that dude gonna be raised that village? Are you gonna be out there getting that getting that food, educating that kid, teaching that kid how to play catch, protecting that young girl? You're not ready to do that, bro. Shut the fuck up. It's, 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 it's also <laughs> it's also what Kelly proved. If you're not educated about something, you should keep your mouth shut. Shut your mouth. Keep your mouth closed. Keep yeah. your mouth closed. Like, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, Jamie. Can you bring up the comment you did have up? Yeah, there we go. Uh, Carol Adams says, "I'm getting ready to mix it up. I resorted to abortion because it was freely available due to my responsibility." Excluding extreme circumstances, where's our responsibility to have safe sex? I think that's a very interesting comment. And um, I just want to say that uh, this person wasn't irresponsible. They were just human. Humans have sex, right? Um, and uh, a lot of what we have to do is kind of uh, give ourselves like grace and, and compassion. You do what you can do at the time. The truth is that contraceptive access, and in my previous segments, I talked about how obstetric sexual reproductive health care is also not always accessible. To me, I believe condoms should be free. We still have to fight in even places like New York City to actually have condom demonstrations for children. That by the time we talk to them about sex, it's in a very didactic form. And it's after many of them have already begun their sexual lives, right? That's right. And so, you know, there was a thing, there was a movement to have access only education. So folks are learning from places that are not giving them proper education. Not everybody has access to anti-racist, youth-friendly health care where they can come in. Like, there's a lot of provider bias. There's had to be a lot. Medicine is not where it should be when it comes to sexual and reproductive health, particularly for Black people. And so I would say, um, you know, give yourself some grace, right? Like humans get pregnant. And if the abortion was available to you at, at the time and that's what you chose, that's the choice that you, that you made. Um, abortion is not a moral failing. Most of the time it's a medical procedure, but we can't assign like good or bad to it, right? And so I think that's when we kind of get into trouble. And I'm saying that I tell my sisters the same thing. When we say, oh, I should not have done that. I shouldn't have dated this person when I did this and all I did this. I say, cut yourself some slack, right? They're often extenuating circumstances and contraceptive access is not like, there are people in my life who cannot take the pill right? And nothing is ever 100%. That's another thing. Like until we make, until we have better contraceptive access available for all genders, right? Why are only like females, people with female parts responsible, right? Most of the time, until we can make it like freely accessible, everything has gone up. Like I just went to Dwayne Reed. I'm like, why, why is condoms $26? And if you're 13, if you're 16, like you have to work two hours, in order to buy a box of condoms, that's not going to last you through the week. Sometimes, if it's spring break, how that doesn't set anybody up for success. And so we are living like these outcomes that we're seeing were by design, right? Other places that value healthcare, like where healthcare is free, totally free, where what you need for sexual and reproductive health, maternal infant health, all of it's free. Right. Like we have manufactured everything that we have. We have manufactured the infant formula shortage. And so like even this is like so crazy to me that we're, you know, uh, discussing abortion 
there's no formula on the show. There's no diapers on the show. Yeah. Go ahead. And Kira says, are we removing God from the ultimate circumstance? Right. Well, for me per personally, God is a part of like literally everything I everything I do. Um, <coughs> I am I have a, a devout spiritual practice. Um, uh, but the thing I love most about the God I serve, and everybody has a different faith tradition, um, is that you know is is the idea of free will, right? I think about when, you know, like I said, I, I come from the Christian faith um, that like there was a conversation with the archangel and Mary. It just wasn't you're having this baby. It was like, what? I'm a virgin. I, like there are like and so people have the right to consent. Um, so for me, that's that's where I take like my agency, my free will to go through life as I choose. Right. I think that that to me is a very powerful spiritual principle. And so um, I will say that we the state shouldn't have the ability to legislate someone else's morality. So having abortion is a part of having access to abortion is a part of the Jewish faith. Do I get to determine what so how somebody else exercise, exercises their faith and so I, this is why i think we get into trouble because not everybody has the same spiritual beliefs or faith practices so that's why the state can be it can't be involved can you imagine if the state said oh you're hindu hindu you can't marry that would make no sense so why do we say oh we're oh christian and this interpret this one narrow interpretation of Christianity or God or spirituality gets to dictate what all of these people have access to. It doesn't hold water because there's no place else in American society really that we say that the religious dogma, we are supposed to have separation of church and state. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So, but the, both the church and the state cannot fit inside of my ovaries. Mm. So they have no place there. Kelly, you have a way with words, I have to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> I try to keep it clean. <laughs> I call it this has been this has been a great, great discussion. Yeah, I yeah, yeah. It's been a great. Absolutely. It really is. It, 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 and well needed. Despite the idiot that we had in there, CeeLo, somebody dumbass. Well, no, I just want to say everybody <laughs> no. is that if you don't ask questions, you can't. No, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, you're right. You're right. No. We're not going to do that. Like everybody's allowed to have their no, opinion. No, you're not going to have an opinion. Show. No, you have an opinion. But the we thing don't is, have to agree with no, it. No, but no, the but, but no. Is. That's what I'm gonna say. When you call us sense, there are four black men on here that probably do more than your lifetime, brother. Correct. Like, correct. He has no have, idea what simping no, is. He no, has no idea. idea. It is what we do in the community. How many kids we take care of and raise that are not our biological children? Yeah. How many kids mm. that we don't send to college? How many sneakers that we don't bought? So calling four brothers, you have no idea about simps. Shut the fuck up. That's what I mean. I'm not gonna dress as big. Everybody got big comments and stuff like that. And it's mm -hmm. about the 20, uh, 260,000. Like people can't afford certain things. There's people that live in Alabama and Arkansas that can't afford $26, my brother. I'm sorry for what you, you don't understand that. And like I said, if you want to call us simps, come up with solutions when these kids are born. You still didn't say anything when we made the comment that what you're gonna do when these kids are born and how you're gonna take care of them in our community. These ladies have all these babies. Are you do you have the, the whereabouts to take care of all these children that you want to see coming to this world? That's all I'm gonna say. Full, full, full disclosure, I do know the brother, all right? He is a black man. I do know the brother, a good father. Uh, very, very big dis difference of opinion, though. I will say that, all right? Yeah. Mm. So he can keep it pushing. Go to go down to the white conservative channels and, and have a good time with him. Anyhow, <laughs> I'm sorry, Jamie. I know you told me not to say nothing, but hey, I had to say what I had to say. Um, anyhow, Kelly, listen, sister, how can people find you? What website should we go to? To check my sister Kelly Davis, and how can we help you in the in the fight, sister? So you can learn more about reproductive justice at newvoicesrj.org. Um, that's where we do a lot of our organizing work. And so reproductive justice is not just about abortion. That was today's topic because of what happened at the Supreme Court. But I'm interested in giving Black people the support they need to actually infertility, you know, address infertility. Um, the last time I was here, I talked about all of our work related to Black maternal health. So making sure that the pregnancies that people choose to bring to term, that people are not dying. At, on, on what's supposed to be the happiest day of their life, right? Fighting so that we are addressing and creating a violence-free world where Black girls do not become prey 
to unscrupulous like aggressors, right? So these are the, all the things that the reproductive justice movement stands for. It's not just abortion. It's about really having the freedom to live through and go through the world however one wants to in whatever skin, whatever hair, whatever sexual expression, and to be like valued in love because every person on the planet, irrespective of whatever decisions they made, it, it, it requires like, uh, you know, we all are human beings. And so reproductive justice is about affirming the humanity of all black people. And I'm just so happy to be able to share a little bit about um, my analysis and the work that we are doing to really save the lives. This is about saving people's lives because what folks don't know is that by outlawing abortion, they're sentencing so many people to three strikes, right? Um, criminalizing them. And then we're sentencing others to death, right? Forced birth can will sentence people to death. And we're already beginning to see that. So please join me uh, there at, on your screen if you'd like to learn more. And I just really want to thank um, each and every one of you for uh, inviting me here today. And I can say, I know for a fact that you guys are not Sims. I can, I'm a testament to what you guys do in the community. Um, you know, Demond, I know has, you know, it's not every day that you come into contact with black men who are affirming black women, affirming black kids in literally everything that they do. Um, and so I'm just like very grateful for this space and to each each of you individually and also collectively. So please keep up the good work. Thank you, sister. Thank you, Kelly. Kelly Hall of Fame. Kelly Hall of Fame, baby. Kelly, first Hall of Fame inductee. <laughs> Nice. Now, thanks for staying on for an hour. You only been 30 minutes, but you did an hour. So. Thank you. <laughs> Thank, All right. you. Thank you. Thank oh, you. Oh.